Open Door Baptist podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, if you have your Bible, let's turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm just going to read a few verses tonight, kind of keep with a similar theme uh, with July the 4th, some things that are taking place tomorrow, and uh, you may be with friends or family, may be with church folks, and maybe you're going to a parade. I know we have a parade in Centralia tomorrow. We have some tracks that we take out, um, and uh, I know some other churches have floats and different things. It's always a good opportunity. Just before coming back tonight, we were over near the mall and at uh, Panera, had some time to kill. And so these tracks that I have, I didn't bring one in, uh, Matt Crane, Final Fight Bible Radio, they put these tracks out, the card tracks. It's got the uh, American flag on one side and a freedom message on the other, a freedom in Christ. And I just walked through the outside, you know, the, the breezeway areas there by the mall only had one turned down, probably gave out over almost 70. Uh, I didn't count them, but it was quite a few tracks. You know, hey, have a nice fourth. Man, everybody was thankful. And uh, so it's a good opportunity. But I want to speak to you tonight about this subject, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I want to speak to you about a soldier. You hear these subjects from time to time. And of course, the Bible speaks a lot about it uh, for you and I. If you've never been in the military, I haven't. My father was in the military, my grandfather was in the military, and uh, other parts of my family, extended family, obviously, uh, men and women been involved in the military. So uh, if, if you've never been in the military, sometimes you feel left out, uh, left out in the sense that uh, you didn't have that experience. And especially if you're a man, uh, sometimes you feel like you haven't done your duty, but believe me this, if you are saved, you're part of God's army. And there is a work for all of us to do. And it has nothing to do with, as we think of, and I'm going to speak about some things tonight, that have to do with strength of mind and strength of heart and, and strength of body. It has to do with a strength of purpose and a commitment and a conviction that we have, not just as Americans, but as Christians. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, very familiar passage for many of us, uh, obviously about this subject. And he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Father, we ask your blessing on the word of God tonight. We know that there's other pulpits uh, throughout this city up and down the west coast, this time zone where... Uh, there are churches that are meeting <clears throat> believers, and uh, Father, we pray for the power of the Spirit of God. We pray for missionaries around the world for this family, the, the Thomases, that they'll get there in the time that you deem necessary for them, deputation missionaries, and uh, minister the Word of God in these last days, last times, Lord, uh, that we might sprint to the finish. And Lord, give us courage. Uh, we live in dark times spiritually. We enjoy great freedoms like we... Uh, enjoyed this morning just to be able to meet here. We didn't have to worry about being bothered or the police wondering why we're coming into this building to meet. We have complete freedom here in America. We're thankful for that. But we realize that, Lord, there is a battle that's raging spiritually, even if we see around us great peace. And, uh, Lord, give us the courage that we need in these last days. Bless your preachers tonight. And uh, Pastor Murphy, Lord, there in Boise, we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. For an even more detailed account of this subject, you'd go to Ephesians chapter 6. But I want to speak to you tonight about a soldier first and foremost. Although most of us are not professional soldiers, we're soldiers nonetheless, spiritual soldiers in Jesus Christ, soldiers trained in the crucible of life. As I said, personally, I've never served in the military. My father was in the Marines and in the Navy. 
and I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, so I'm a, a child of the baby boomers, and my father was in the military when, when I was born, and uh, lived two years there in Virginia, then was raised in Amarillo, Texas, far from the water. And uh, I was a graduate in high school, 1974, so it was right at the end. I had a draft card, but right at the end of the uh, Vietnam War, President uh, Nixon you know, made it a way for the, the troops to come back. So I missed all of that. I probably was not favorable when I think back of my time and the things that I said about that war. But nonetheless, if you served, you served with honor. And uh, regardless of the politics, and I realized that a lot of times uh, things got caught up in the Korean conflict and and then uh, Vietnam and they said well it wasn't a war it was this and that yes but men were uh, sent and deployed to those places and they stood for our freedoms they weren't involved in all the political decisions so I'm thankful tonight that if you were part of that uh, time and you say well I've never sir I served but I didn't serve in wartime yes but you could have right you were there being vigilant about our uh, peace and and protecting that here in America, but I thought of my father and just remembering some things about his life. I later got saved, and of course, then as a soldier in Jesus Christ, I began to get my training, and I got my manual right here, and I began to understand that I had an enemy. It wasn't a fight that really I chose, but it's one that you're thrown into once you get saved. You have the Savior, and you have goodness, and you have love, and kindness, and compassion on one side, and righteousness, and on the other, of course, we have the devil, and we know that he is our enemy, and whether you want this fight or not, he's going to bring the fight to you, and to your house, and to this church, and to this country, and there's no way of escaping the fact that we are, as believers, men, women, young people, children, anybody that gets saved, you are a soldier, the Bible says, in Jesus Christ. I want to speak to you tonight about some things that are, these are just bullet points. So we're going to look at some scripture and just kind of go through some things. It has to do with the practical things of not just the ministry, but as a Christian. Some years ago, my wife and I, we went to the library and we saw something that was interesting there. It was uh, about the SEAL training. This particular training took place down in California, there off of Coronado Island and in the frigid waters of the Pacific. Hopefully they do it in the winter. Uh, they have several sessions, but uh, they did a number of these different, at that time it was VHS tapes, and you could see the training. Not all of it, obviously. They're not going to let you see that, but you got to see a pretty good progression of that in Hell Week and all the different things that they did. And it was enlightening, to say the least. And then uh, several years ago, I listened to the, probably it's about 20-some-odd minutes, um, it's a commencement address that was given by Admiral William H. McRaven, who was born in Carolina, later became uh, part of the United States military via the uh, Navy, and became a U.S. SEAL, a Navy SEAL. And he graduated from University of Texas in Austin, and uh, he was asked to come back because at that time, uh, he was the commander of the U.S. Special Forces Operations Command. He retired in uh, 2014, so he was part of that command, was the head of it, for three years. He organized, with the CIA and, of course, the military, a lot of different people, the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. He took his training at Coronado, as I said, in those frigid waters. And some of the things that we saw on that tape, I mean, if you know anything about surf, some of the men that went there, I don't think they knew anything about surf. And uh, they didn't realize how cold it was. And you'd see some men try to jump through the waves, like, you know, through the top of it. It doesn't work that way, right? You got to go underneath it. They found out real quick, and that's called improvisation. You know, they improvise very, very well, and they learn that. But this man went through in his comm commencement address. I've heard a number of different in high schools and colleges commencement addresses, and you know, sometimes it's just a ho hum. And sometimes you're thinking, man, they could have got somebody else to do this, right? To give these young people something. But what this man said. Uh, I don't know if he's a Christian, but biblically, each one of these points uh, fits. And these aren't all the points and the things that he said, but a few. So first of all, let's look at this. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He said, don't cheat because you're going to get caught. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Lawfully. In the NHL, they have a team, the Washington Capitals, and in their locker room, I don't know if they still have it, some years ago they had, uh, and you may have seen this, there's banners that have this, T-shirts and so forth. It said, if you don't win fair, you don't win at all. You don't win at all. The idea that fairness, the idea of honesty as a Christian. You say, well, nobody's going to know about it. He does. Amen. Fudging, cheating, telling what we call a little white lie. Well, I just took a little bit of this. I took a little bit of that. And hey, you know, everybody does it. Don't let that be said of you as a Christian. The Bible speaks about honesty. I'll just read you a few verses here. You're welcome to turn to them. It's in Hebrews chapter 13, what he says about honesty as a believer and what our um, attitude should be within this world. Because believe me, in, an, in a world that I'm not going to say that it's all dishonest because it's not. You'll find honest people out there. But, you know, if I mention certain pursuits and careers, you're going to smile. Why? Because... You're cynical about those careers. You think you look at them with a kind of a, a jaded eye, right? You don't think of them as being, I'm not going to mention them because somebody here may be one of those, <laughs> part of that career. And, you know, sometimes people do that about the ministry because ministers fall. They are involved in sin. They do stupid things. They embarrass the church. They embarrass their families. They do dishonest things. They do immoral things. And, People, sometimes Christians, tend to paint everybody in the ministry with the same brush. And that's not fair, right? It's not fair for us to do that, but we tend to do that. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 18, he says, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Honestly. To provide things, he says in, in the book of Romans, uh, honest before all men. So he said, first of all, don't cheat, you'll get caught. Secondly, he said, trust your training, your weaponry, and your instruments. Where is this found? Well, look in 2 Timothy. We're going to just keep going back to this passage. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. You saw on the missionary's uh, letter tonight, somebody had a vision, which is what? You can't just win people. You have to train people. Uh, that Jesus Christ raised up men. He spent... Uh, three and a half years of his life, pouring himself into these men, training these men so that they could do what? They could go out and train others. And then it just continues on out. That's the danger uh, with evangelism sometimes that's not carried up with some type of discipleship or training. Now is the time, that critical period for a Christian for those first six months to a year where they have to submit to it, obviously, but they need to learn something from the scriptures that's going to solidify and give them a foundation and uh, to uh, establish them. But you have to trust your training and your weaponry and your instruments. So what are they to teach? He says, teach others also. Look in 2 Timothy, you're right there, chapter 3, verse 15, 16, and 17. And that from a child, 2 Timothy 3, 15, Thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, look, may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Remember I said this is my manual. I have a library. I have an office, I have a small library for most preachers, but I have all these books. And uh, some books are reference books, some books are missionary books, some books are doctrinal books, some books are devotional books, some are written by men, some are written by women, some are, uh, some are books written by lost people, books that give me knowledge, books that help me. But listen, if everything was gone tomorrow and all I was left with was my Bible, the Bible says... Jesus said, Paul said, this is enough. 
This is my weapon. This is my sword. It's the one weapon that you're given in Ephesians chapter 6. And he says, and having done all, therefore, to stand. This man, um, Admiral McRaven, talked about learning how to attack enemy ships. And of course, as SEALs, obviously strong swimmers, and this was an exercise that was done at night. He said sometimes they would have long swims, and this, in this particular case, they're going to take out an enemy ship that's in a port, and so they'll drop them somewhere out maybe several miles at night from this ship, and they have to swim underwater, obviously with uh, you know, some type of device. And the water, if it's during the day, it will filter the light so that you can see some things but by the time you get up to a larger ship where they want to put their explosives is at the deepest part the largest part of that ship in the rear part of the ship the keel that's down deeper right and they want to attach those explosives there and he said what happens is as you get up to the ship he said the rest of the ship blocks out the light it's dark even during day and he said in the sounds of the mechanicals going on inside the the belly of that ship it's deafening through the water and he said it's disorienting uh, orientating to the individual and he said it's fearful because you're on enemy territory you're behind enemy lines you are doing something that if they catch you there's not going to be any mercy and he said you have to be razor focused on what you're about to do and you have to trust your training, what you were taught to do. And you have to trust your instruments. In this, play, in this case, it's a compass because you can't come up like a, you know, with your periscope and looking around. You have to stay under the water. You follow your compass and your depth gauge until you get up there and serve your mission. Men that have been pilots, you realize what's known as vertigo not talking about necessarily the vertigo that makes people dizzy sick and stumble around but what pilots refer to as spatial disorientation in other words you're flying and you feel like that you're you're flying your inner ear is telling you i'm flying straight and level but your instruments are not telling you that what are you supposed to trust you better trust your instruments or you're gonna die and any pilot knows that, and uh, fighter pilots obviously understand that. I've talked to pilots that were not in the military, just, you know, uh, average pilots that, you know, they fly for pleasure. And they've talked about, almost all of them have experienced at one time or another something like this. And usually it can be brought on by stress. When that happens, it's terrifying. Why? Because, well, they talk about VFR and IFR, you know, visually flying and then by instruments. And when you do your instrument rating, they put that shield over your head. You can't see anything but your instruments. Why? They want you to understand you need to trust the instruments that are on this plane. Listen, you need to trust your book. Amen. Somebody's going to tell you something. Dr. So-and-so is going to say this. Some great Christian leader is going to say this or that. Listen, filter whatever is said. And I'm sure your pastor, Pastor Murphy, would not uh, be adverse to me saying this. Whatever he says, whatever I say, whatever any of the leadership or any other evangelist or missionaries or anybody comes in here says, filter it through the word of God. Why? This is your manual. This is what God gave us. Men, well, we can be at fault. We can have a wrong doctrine. We can teach something that's wrong. We can get, you know, sidetracked. It happens all the time. Trust your training. The third thing he said is don't stop doing the usual, the mundane. Second Timothy chapter 2. Life gets pretty mundane sometimes, right? You have to go through the motions. You get up. You think about your, your, your work and you think about your life and you have your clock and you have your, some of you are very regulated. You have the same breakfast every morning. You have the same coffee. You stop at the same place. You think about the habits that you have. And really when you think about it, it can be very mundane, boring and so forth. But what happens? You say, well, I, I want to get out of the mundane. I, I want to experience life. Well, sometimes that's when people get disoriented. They get sidetracked. This man said, 
as a soldier, you need to remember that the mundane and the usual, it has a, it has a purpose, no matter how small it is. He said in, here in our passage, 2 Timothy 2, 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, because that's what will happen. We have to make a living. We have to work. We have to do the things that, well, is part of Adam's curse. And uh, you can take pleasure in your work. And, and I would tell you as a Christian to shoot as high as you can. If you're a young person here, achieve as much as you can. Go as high as you can. Be better than the people in the world. Be the best of the best of the best. If you work for Boeing and you're an engineer, be the best engineer that they have. The most honest engineer. The one that they can trust above all others. That should be the striving of every Christian to be the best at what you do. But don't get entangled. It's so easy to do. A little bit here, a little bit there. David, you know the passage, 2 Samuel chapter 11. At the time when kings went forth to battle, where was David? Well, David wasn't in the battle. David was in the palace. And you know the story. He walked out on the, um, the deck, modern terms, and he looked down and there was Bathsheba. And you know the rest. It caused him grief for the rest of his life. He paid for that. He stepped outside of the usual. Admiral McRaven spoke about <laughs> making your bed. Making your bed. Come on. He said, you know, that's so simple. He said, it, it seems so silly. I mean, here we are, he says, we're trained to be the best. These are seals. We are trained to be the best warriors on the planet. And you're worrying about how I made my bed? Yeah. Every morning, squared, tight, tucked, pillow-centered, blanket neatly followed at the foot of the rack. Or what? Well, don't do it and find out. And over time, what does that do? Becomes part of your persona, becomes part of the usual. Uh, what are we talking about? Simple little things like read your Bible every day. I'm not telling you how much. I'm not saying you have to read for hours. I know that you're busy. I know that you have demands on your time. I know you have families. I know you have all these things. But listen, spend some time in this book. Amen. And what will it do? It'll hold down the garbage in your life that's reaching out to entangle you and you got that scripture in your mind and man, the red flags are coming up all over because why? You spent some time in the Word of God this morning and you stay with the usual, with the mundane. He said something else. He said, don't fixate on your inabilities or my inabilities, but rather he said, and I'm putting this in, because uh, he applied it as a soldier just within the military. I'm, a, I'm putting a different focus on this. He said, don't just think about your own inabilities. But he was talking about the greater group, you know, uh, the men that you're with. But I'm going to take that and say this. As Christians, focus on God's abilities in you, not just your inabilities. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's some men here that, you know, just in and of themselves, they have strength of character, strength of mind, strength of will, and they're just not going to fall. Uh, you're not looking at one of those. Uh, people say, I'm praying for you. I said, good, you don't know how much I need that. Left to myself, if, if I, if I could fall so easily, I, I'm weak. I don't have very good willpower. Uh, there were certain things when I got saved that I could, I could put down immediately, and there were other things that I struggled with for a year, two years. There are some things I've been struggling with for over 35 years. Sins of the heart. Certain things that you may not struggle with, but I struggle with. I see my inabilities all the time. I recognize my inabilities, which makes me focus even more on God's abilities. Why? Because... If you're saved, you have God in you. The Bible says that we have 
Christ in us. It's in Colossians chapter 1, it's called a mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have the power of Jesus Christ in us. And so you say, well, I, I just can't do that. I don't have the power to do that. Exactly. But you are empowered. Enabling, that's a little bit different. Paul was called... But his enabling did not come till later on. But just start down the path and God will give you what you need when you need it. You hear preachers and you hear Christians talk about grace. And they talk about somebody that's a Christian that's dying. And they talk about dying grace. What is that? Oh, that's very real. That's not a grace that anybody experiences until when? Until you're going to die. And when you die, God steps in. You're, you're there sometimes with a Christian and you see them go through that. And you may know this person very well and realize this that they're experiencing is outside of themselves. And greater than their own faith. Well, that's God in us. Christ said in John chapter 15, for without me, ye can do nothing. Admiral McRaven talked about one of the crews that they had, a boat crew, because what they'll do is um, they have a, looks like a little dinghy. You know, it's one of those, we used to call them fuscoto in Greek. It's the, um, it's the rubber boats, you know, that they have. And it seats about six guys, three on either side, uh, just, you know, with their legs over or just inside there. And then they have the coxswain that's in the back. And the idea is here that they, it's very simple. They paddle out through the surf and they go out by this buoy and then they come back and ride the surf in. Well, winter surf in California, it could be six, seven, eight foot high and it pounds. It's dangerous. It's absolutely cold. You go out here in the winter, uh, obviously they use wetsuits if you see people swimming or, or you know, probably don't see anybody swimming, but you'll see some surfers and guys like that out there. They're going to use wetsuits. Because why? The water can get down on the 40 degree level. Sometimes with upwelling that comes from uh, up here in Alaska, it'd be even colder, just frigid. And so they get them out there and they have to listen, they have to work together. And he said, one of the best teams that we had, these guys were all, there wasn't one guy on that team that was over five foot five. Just, they call them the munchkin crew. And they laughed because they, they said they got these little bitty flippers. But they were better swimmers than anybody else. They outswam, they out, uh, you know, paddled. They did everything better than somebody else. Why? Because they worked together. And they realized they listened to the coxswain that's in the back of the boat. And they did exactly what he told them to do. And they made it through the surf and they made it back time and time and time again. What should you do? Focus not on your inabilities or those that are around you, but focus on the abilities that God gives. Something else he said in doing our best, he said we still fail. And as a Christian, I would tell you, you need to realize in those times that your excellence is in Christ. Amen. It's in Christ. Second Timothy chapter 2, it's in another passage a little further down in verse 12. He says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Well, what does that mean? If Christ is in you the hope of glory, he's not going to deny himself. That's unbelievable security in the Lord Jesus Christ. In doing your best, you're still going to fail. Can I read you something that Charles Spurgeon said? And uh, this quotation, he includes himself. This was... Uh, said in a message in 1864 he was preaching out of Zechariah chapter 10 and he said this quote he said the feeble way in which we have performed any duty that devolved upon us the sad manner in which we have met any temptation that assailed us the impatient and murmuring spirit in which we have endured any affliction that has come upon us all these must have shown us that even after we are renewed by divine grace Though the spirit indeed is willing, yet the flesh is weak. And though to will is present with us, 
yet how to perform that which is good we find not. You know, Admiral McRaven said that they, another thing that they did in SEAL training was that they had daily inspection, daily inspection. And he said, listen, throughout the training, everybody failed. At some point, they're gonna find something on your uniform, your buttons, something. And once they failed, they had to go through what was called circus. It wasn't fun. It was after the training of a grueling day and they spent two more hours in calisthenics and they had to get wet and sandy. They made them go out, jump in the surf and then roll in that sand. Oh man, you know what that does to your skin and you know, all those places in your body where that begins to rub. He said, but you know what we noticed over time is that that exercise, so you don't want to fail for the purpose of failing for this purpose, but he said that some of the men that failed more than others, because of this type of training, they became stronger soldiers. They became stronger. It led them to be stronger and the extra training led them to be better leaders, even in that respect. In doing our best, don't forget that our excellence is in Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 17, the Bible says this. In Luke chapter 17, it speaks about something that men that have been involved in the military, men and women, they hear this word all the time. Luke chapter 17, and at the end of the verse, in verse 10, he says, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do, our duty. You know, there's another passage that is quoted in the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon speaks about, and he says this about duty. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and in verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. In doing your best, Remember who you're doing it for. And even when you fail, the Lord is able to take, look at David. I mean, his sin was done in private and the Lord showed it to all of Israel in public. Did it affect the rest of his kingship? It did. Did it affect his family? It did. But what did the Lord do in spite of that? Do you remember what happened when Nathan came in before David and he told the riddle right and David said to him, this is the judgment. And then Nathan, who was evidently a friend of David's and knew him intimately, had to turn to him and say, thou art the man. And David said, I have sinned. And you know, the Lord blessed him in spite of all that. And, and guess what? I mean, that, I don't know if you follow this through the genealogy, but whose son was Solomon? Obviously David's, but this was Bathsheba's son. Even in spite of the embarrassment, even in spite of the sin. So you see that the Lord, in spite of ourselves, he'll use you even when you fail. He'll use it for his glory. I'm not telling you to reach for failure or to try for failure, but failure is probably going to find you at some point in the Christian life. Mr. McRaven said this, Admiral McRaven said, go it alone at your own peril. He said, unity of effort is the best path. Well, the Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he said, faithful men, faithful men. How do you think... How do you think Paul felt and Barnabas when they went out on their first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13? I mean, it was an exciting time. They were the first of the first of the first. Jesus Christ gave the command in Acts chapter 1, go ye into all the world. He told them, tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with power. And then go out into Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. And so they were part of a church in Antioch that was outside of Jerusalem. And yet it was from that church that the Lord gathered those men together. And out of that group of men, it says that the Holy Spirit chose Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And they were sent out. The church laid their hands on them and sent them out. And man, they are excited. They're going out. The work begins. They have some opposition, the sorcerer. And then 
that ominous passage in Acts chapter 13, verse 13. And it says that John Mark, returning from them, you know, he left. He quit. You try to go it alone, what's going to happen? Well, Jesus Christ didn't even go it alone. He chose the men, right, that were with him. Twelve, he lost one of those. Eleven disciples that were with him, they ate with him. Yes, there's times when he separated from them and he was in the ship alone or he was up in the mountain alone or he was praying and he had that alone time with the Father. But generally speaking, he surrounded himself with men and taught those men. They taught others. And now we're reading where Paul, he's probably third generation and he's telling Timothy now fourth generation, you need to train faithful men. You can't do it alone. Go it alone at your own peril. Ephesians speaks about that. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Teamwork is learned by every task. Admiral McRaven said, the rubber dinghy, seven men, six paddlers, one coxswain in the back. They had to paddle together or they're not going to make it through the surf. What, what's the, what's, what are they trying to teach them? How to paddle better? <laughs> no, that's not the exercise. The exercise is you need to trust the man on your left and on your right. When men fly, fighter pilots, they talk about flying, and they talk about having somebody that's doing what? They're checking their 6 o'clock. There's somebody watching behind you. Well, listen, I don't have eyes in the back of my head. I, I can't always trust somebody else to be looking out for me. I'm thankful for the people that pray for me and people I don't even know about. But listen, I know that I have the Lord God and the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And he's looking out for me and he's holding me up in places where I don't even know. And I think, boy, I did good there. And the Lord's like, if you only knew. If you only knew. Go it alone at your own peril. Missionaries sometimes come to mind you pray for them, but you know, sometimes missionaries get, and I can say this because I was a missionary for many years, sometimes missionaries tend to get, you know, the me oh my oh attitude. I'm the only one. Listen, if you are in a field where you are very alone, you're not alone. You have the Lord God. And Bob Jones Sr. said, and of course it's biblical, if you have God on your side, one man, and God, that's a majority over all the others. Here's, here's Elijah out there, or Elisha, and you remember the story how they're encompassed by the army and things aren't looking good, and his servants, he's upset and he's young and he's inexperienced and, and he's distraught. And the Lord says, Lord, or he says, uh, Elisha says, open his eyes. And he opens his eyes and he sees round about that the hillside, the mountains are full of the chariots of fire. And we can't see into the other realm. I mean, the Lord could give you that ability, but we don't have that ability unless he gives it to you. But through this book, I see through a glass darkly. One day face to face. So right now I know what's in that other realm. And I know that in a time when I may feel very alone and very isolated and very vulnerable, that I have the Lord God. He's checking my six o'clock. And then as Christians, he tells us to walk circumspectly. What does that mean? You're walking like this. You're looking around. You're not just focused on what's in front of you. You know, they talk about, um, you know, who would win a martial artist or MMA guy or the wrestler or the Gracie brothers and all that type of thing. The idea of martial arts, many of those where they train and they have, they have uh, kata, they have forms, they're training for multiple opponents. Why? Because here's what happens. If you're a wrestler, you may be really good, and you'll take somebody down, and you've got the guy tied up on the ground, but what if he has three other friends, or one other friend, and he comes up behind your neck with a knife, and whoosh, you're done. In other words, you have nobody protecting your six o'clock, and anybody that's been involved in warfare, there has to be 
Somebody has to fly that point. Somebody has to walk that trail. Somebody has to walk that point. But behind them is somebody else and their eyes are trained for the enemy and they've been trained to do all this. They will train you not to go alone. And even those that go out, the snipers and others that go out alone, they have tremendous support right behind them. Never let fear, is another point, never let fear be your counselor. 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you would look at it, 2 Timothy chapter 2, because we live in a day and age when people are um, absolutely just terrified. People go all the time in America. I say America because, uh, you know, in many of the other countries that experience more poverty and not the prosperity that we have, one, they don't have any money to pay a psychiatrist. Number two, they're not really worried about all those things. They're worried about eating that day. It's Americans that pour out all their dribble, you know, a lot of times, and their phobias. Phobias, those are fears. It's a Greek word, phobos, phobias, fears. People have fears of all kinds of things, and if you're not careful, what will the devil do? He's the king in the book of Job over all the children of pride, and he is the king, it says, uh, of terrors. What does he want to do? He wants to terrorize your heart. He wants to make you fearful. If you're fearful, you won't go out and you won't engage in the warfare that God has for you, right? You, you'll shrink away from that. And each of the authors of the Bible, they speak in some form about this. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, And thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's no place for fear there. Fear is not Paul's counselor. He actually says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. If you have a preacher that you hear that produces fear with his voice and fear in your heart, that's not a, that's not a, a spirit that's coming from God. That's coming from somebody else. That's abusive preaching. There is such a thing as spiritual abuse. It happens all the time in this country. Sometimes it happens from fundamentalist preachers. That's why you have to filter what comes from people's mouth or through the YouTube or through this thing or that thing or, or some CD that you listen to. And you say, boy, that sounded great. Does it agree with this book? Amen. Right? God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of, what does it say in this passage? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. We have somebody in our family right now that's dealing with fear and terror, and she's not born again. Well, that's the main point, right? Jesus Christ can be your anchor in a life. Whatever the fear is, fear of this, fear of that, whatever it is, you let fear be your counselor, and that'll be the end of you. You need to put, you say, well, it, it, sounds, it, it sounds contrary to fear God. That's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, and the beginning of understanding. If you fear God, Joseph, when he saved his brothers and he saved all of Egypt and he saved Pharaoh and the rest of them through all those troubles, what he says to them is, I fear God. Not the gods of the Egyptians, I fear God. This is the only one that you have a right to fear. And that fear will embolden you against the rest of the world that will try to terrorize you. He said something else quickly. He said, don't forget your joy and your purpose and your final end. When life is not joyful and purposeful. You know, sometimes in their training, he said they would go out to Tijuana, which is just south of San Diego, and they go out to what they call the mud flats. And he said they would push them down on this mud. They were up to their neck in mud. It was cold, it was windy, it was wet, it was miserable. They were out there for hours. And they told them as they were buried out there, they said, all right, the first five guys to quit, we can all leave. And nobody got, no, hours went by, nobody got out of the mud. Finally, one guy, they're all shivering. One guy starts to sing. It was terrible, he says. It was, you know, his voice was cracking and all, but it emboldened everybody. We all sang, and the guy said, shut up or you're going to be out here all night. Nobody stopped singing. What are they doing? They're... They're learning what the Bible said here, hardness as a good soldier. 
to find out that our purpose as believers, well, there are going to be times when it's going to drive you to tears and it's going to drive you to your knees. And there'll be times as a Christian when there's deep sorrow, not just a little bit, but deep sorrow. Do you think it bothered Jesus Christ that Judas went out and did what he did? I think it bothered him. I think when, he, when Judas came to him in the garden, certainly Christ knew what was going to happen, right? And when, when you read that passage and Judas comes up to him and betrays him with a kiss, Jesus says to him these words, friend, friend. He had that love and that compassion. As Christians, when sometimes dark times or... Um, I don't use the word necessarily depression, but uh, disappointment comes in your life. Don't forget the purpose. This life is just, a, well, it's a vapor. And one day, what are we going to get? As bad as it can get down here, and some bad things can happen to Christians. We get to go to heaven. I mean, you get to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if, if there's no other thought that sustains you, let that thought sustain your mind. And the last thing I'd like to say is this, and he brought this out, and we actually saw that this happen time and time again on those tapes. Because you see, SEALs training is strictly voluntary. And you volunteer to go, and you can volunteer to quit at any time. He said this, and speaking to these college students, he said, quitting is an option. But it's not an option that you should choose. But you can quit. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We need to learn how to finish. If a man also strive for masteries. Masteries is the top. Olympic athletes, people that train, and, you know, maybe in modern times there's money in that, I guess. You know, sponsorships and whatnot. But for many years, millennia, there was no compensation. It was just the joy of competing. And they trained and trained and trained and trained for what? To be the best of the best of the best. Push themselves, push themselves. And those that would train them, pushing them to the very point where they're ready to quit and realizing that the mind takes the body one step further. One step further. Well... I'm not telling you to have the, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can attitude. Because for a Christian, that's really not it. For the Christian, it's God in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And I would tell you that quitting is an option. John Mark quit. But you can't tell me that didn't bother Paul. And that that didn't bother Barnabas. And in fact... I know that it bothered him because the next time that John Mark's name comes up in Acts chapter 15, it causes a rift between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas says, let's go visit the churches. And Paul says, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And he says, oh, by the way, Barnabas says, I, I want to take John Mark. I know he didn't do good the first trip, but I want to take him. Paul says, absolutely not. He's a quitter. We're not taking this guy. I'm kind of reading between the lines, but you, you get the passage, right? Because what happened? They split that day. You're never going to read about Barnabas another time in the book of the Acts. All you're going to read about is Paul. Barnabas is out there somewhere. John's out there. You'll read about John Mark again. And it's Paul that mentions him that he redeems himself. But I tell you, don't even start down that path of quitting. You may get to the point where you're not making any forward progress. Ephesians 6, having done all, therefore, stand. Maybe that's all you can do. Maybe you're just kind of leaning in the right direction. But stand, and having done all, therefore, to stand. And listen, within a local church like this, you have great opportunity to join hands and arms and hearts with other people that are going to encourage you. Those seals... They have a strong team, right? Six men. They all have cross training. They know what the other can do. They know each other very well. They're trained to work just like that. But they have to depend on one another. For you and I, sometimes other Christians will quit. And if that happens, well, 
you're supposed to continue on no matter what. What happened with these SEAL soldiers, these men that they volunteered? Well, in the middle of their training ground where they stayed in their barracks, there was a big brass bell. And they showed them from the very beginning all you have to do to quit. And there's no shame, guys. Nobody's going to ask any questions. Nobody's going to ridicule you because this training is the toughest training on earth. He said, you just ring that bell and you take your helmet with your number on it and you lay it at the base of that uh, pillar there with that bell and you walk away. Nobody says anything. You continue your training in the military and whatever rank you were before, but as far as the SEALs are concerned, you're out. And they have men that are great men, good leaders, that even among the trainers, those officers, they're arguing among themselves. You get this on the tapes that we saw where they're like, this guy is going to quit. I know he's going to ring that bell, but man, he is a, he's an awesome leader. We, can, we, we can't soften this for anybody. Everybody goes through the same training. You have to make it through this training. Well, the Lord's training us, raising us up. And this church is sending out and training men and women and young people to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe they're not going to be preachers. Maybe they're not going to be pastors or evangelists or missionaries. Maybe they're going to work somewhere in the secular world. But listen, be the best you can be in that position. Be honest. Be a Christ-like witness. God knows the public school, the universities, uh, the political machines, the large corporations, uh, you know, whatever company it is, they need a witness in this world. And all they've got, folks, is us. All they've got is us. Let's bow our heads for prayer.